Hey there, Python trainer Ruben Lerner here. And today I want to show you some of the very exciting features that are in the next version, the new version of Jupyter Notebook, known as Notebook 7. I've been using Jupyter for a very long time. In fact, I started using it back when it was called the IPython Notebook. Then it became Jupyter, and now Jupyter is, well, lots of different things. In particular, it's what's known as the Jupyter Lab because it has lots of different facilities and plugins and extensions and languages you can use. But many of us, some of us old timers especially, have stuck with the old fashioned Jupyter Notebook because you know what? It did what we needed. We didn't need anything super fancy. Well, the Jupyter developers have listened to our call and they, the next version, this upcoming version of Notebook 7 is packed full of amazing features, some of which were in Jupyter Lab and some of which are completely new. So the first thing to do is to install Notebook 7. Now it hasn't been released yet, it's a pre-release version. So if I go to my command line, and yes, you have to do this from the command line, I say Jupyter minus minus version. This is gonna show me the version of every Jupyter related package on my current system. And we're gonna ignore most of these, but we're gonna look at the notebook. We're gonna see the notebook is currently at 6.5.4. That is the latest production release. But if I want to install the new one, I have to again at the command line say pip, install minus big U, that's for upgrading, notebook. Actually, that's not enough. That's not enough because it, I have to say minus minus pre. Minus minus pre means if there is a newer version and it is pre-release, then install it. So now pip is gonna go to PyPI, compare versions, download if it needs, it's actually cached on my system, install it, and we will now see, here we go, uninstalled 654, installed 700RC2. And if I now look once again at the versions of things on my system, look at that, notebook zero, uh, 700RC2. Now I'm just gonna, well, I'll do it from this directory. Now I run Jupyter Notebook. Again, I run it from my directory. This is my home directory on my computer. It starts up a bunch of things. And once again, as usual, as has happened for many, many years, when you start Jupyter, you get a list of the files and folders in your current directory, and that's what I get. It looks a little different than it did before, but it works. So let's say I want to start a new notebook. I go over to the new menu and I have for years chosen new and then which kernel I want, new notebook. But now I just choose a notebook. I don't choose the kernel just yet. It starts up the notebook and then it asks me what kernel I want. If you're saying kernel, what does that mean? It means which backend language system do you want to use? Now for most people I know, and certainly for me, Python 3 is the kernel that I want to use most of the time, also known as the IPY kernel, but there are many languages, systems, versions available out there that you can use. Use what you want. And I'm not going to say this is the preferred kernel because, well, maybe in the future I want to use something else. I click on select, it starts up, and as soon as this circle is white, here we go, kernel status idle. And now I can put in whatever Python code I want. Print, hello, world. Fantastic. Until here, it's a little different, a little different than we've seen in the past with Jupyter Notebook, but not majorly different. It looks like a cleaner sort of layout. They've changed maybe the font, it looks like a little bit, nothing overwhelming. So let's get to some of the overwhelming things. So first of all, when I teach, I often use a lot of markdown. So I'll say like, you know, agenda for today, and we'll be doing a lot of things. And then I'll put a whole bunch of stuff there. So let's, let's say I'm talking about, uh, I don't know, pandas, right? So I'll say here, pandas and it's good for, you know, data science. Well, let's just do this. I'll do Panda, then I'll say, you know, import pandas as PD. And then I'll say here, I'll do some more markdown. Uh, we'll say series, and I'll say here, S equal to series. You know, nothing to go like this. I could do like PD series, right? And then I'll say here, markdown also, this is gonna be data frame. And you can see, all right, and I'll just do one more top level one. So homework, not that I really give homework, right? And then I'd say here, let's say, you know, question one, question two, and question three. Okay, this is enough. You can see then that I basically created with these different headlines, a variety, this looks like it's, yeah, it should be actually two air, and this should be two here as well, otherwise, yeah, there we go. You can see I had basically an outline of markdown stuff. Okay, that's nice, watch this. I can now go to view, and I can open up the table of contents. And now it shows top level, second level, and if I had them, third level headlines. And I can click to them, and be put on the appropriate place, on the appropriate cell. Especially for someone like me who teaches every day and I end up having a lot of stuff, this will allow me and my students to navigate through the notebook much more easily. 
Okay, so that's amazing feature number one. Amazing feature number two is um, I get a lot of comments on my YouTube channel and when I'm teaching that it's sometimes hard to read the code in my notebook, right? So like you see here, print, hello world, maybe that would be a little nicer if it were bigger. Well, sure, I can make the whole browser bigger or the whole browser smaller, but that's all the text. Maybe I don't want to make everything bigger or smaller. Well, we now have themes on Jupyter Notebook. And the first thing that people might notice about the themes, if I say choose theme, is I can make it light or dark. Ta-da, now it's dark theme. Truth be told, I actually like the light theme, but maybe that's because I'm a little bogey. But the other things we can change in the theme are increase code font size or decrease code font size, as opposed to content, as opposed to the UI. We can now adjust the sizes of the code, the content, and the UI differently, separately. So I can make the code bigger. Let's do that a little more here. Make the code a little bigger, right? I don't need to make my documentation any bigger. The important thing is the code, and I want people to be able to see that. Okay, fantastic. Let's actually write some code. So I'm going to say here, uh, def, uh, let's do myself, say splat numbers. And then I'll say here, total equals zero for, oops, for one number in numbers say total plus equal one number, and then we'll say here, return total. Not super exciting, right? I can say my sum of 10, 20, 30, and it works just fine. Okay, let's say though there is a bug in there, or let's say I add a, you know, call it with a bug. I say my sum of 10, 20, 30. Notice now I'm gonna call it with a list, list rather than with individual arguments. And so now, I call it and I get an error. Oh no, that's terrible, right? I don't want an error. And I see that it's happening here on line five there. Hmm, what can I do? Well, watch this. I can say view the debugger panel. That's right. And I can now open up the debugger. And that's right, Jupyter now comes with a debugger. And I'll say, well, the problem is on line five, so I'm gonna click here. And now that's gonna set a breakpoint for that line in my function. Now I can try running it again, and look at that. We've stopped. Where have we stopped? We've stopped on that line. It even shows me what line we're on, and it shows me here are the local variables, numbers, which is a tuple, and one number, which is a list. And we can, of course, go down here and take a look, and we'll see this is a tuple, list, right? And we've got all this stuff here. It has len of one. Really? Really? And the, the zeroth element there is a list. That's already kind of strange. And one number here is a list. So you can really, and look, we can even see the values in that list of length three. You can see here the breakpoints, right? And, and so you can, and you can go back up and down in the call stack and look at different uh, stack frames. So you can look at different levels of local variables to really understand what's going on. And then when I'm done debugging, I can click on this, poof, debugging done, because of course now I know that it was actually not the function's fault, it was my fault for calling in this way. I've often told people that there are two generally clear use cases for Jupyter versus IDEs or different use cases that IDEs are really for when you are developing real software. And Jupyter is where I do my experiments, where I try things out, where I teach, and where I do data analysis. What happens if you want to debug inside of Jupyter? Until now, I basically had to say to people, use PDB or maybe dump it into an IDE. Now Jupyter has an amazing debugger that you can use and you're no longer forced to make as much of a distinction between them, uh, the worlds are kind of colliding. There are other pieces here to the new Notebook 7 that's coming out, but I think these are the main things that are kind of blowing me away. Are there things that you know about, that you've seen, that you want to tell me about, that I should explore? Let me know in the comments. I hope this has been interesting and fun. I definitely encourage you to download and install Notebook 7. Take a look, give it a whirl. I think you'll love it. All right, I'll be back soon with more about Python pandas and everything having to do with them. Hope to hear from you. See you here soon. Bye.